What other challenges to the movement or to open culture or open class and deserve more consideration? So we've kind of well, I think this is like an important conversation over the future, right? Because like as we, you know, Andrea was also saying this thing where like we are getting like super mega like uh, detail <laughs> digitizations of some paintings. And there's also a cost for those things, right? And there's like a material cost for all of our digital interactions. And we're like very much shy, like uh, shying away from that conversation uh, when we need to have it. And sometimes we uh, tend to think that, oh, you know, now we are gonna go digital and then nothing is like gonna matter that much, right? Um, because we're not gonna have like the same footprint and all of that. And I think that's also kind of a myth too, right? But I, I'm not sure, like, so I think that there's a connection there to be made around like open knowledge and, you know, how um, open culture in particular could help with some of these conversations on the climate crisis. Um, but I think, you know, and there are like many ways in which that could happen. Of course, like we've seen this with the pandemic too, like uh, in the midst of the pandemic, the fact that people had the ability to participate and remix their culture like was kind of fundamental for um, a lot of people that were in their homes, right? And I think that one of the things that we're going to see more and more is that as the impacts of the climate crisis are felt more strongly, like the situation that we live with the pandemic is also going to become like kind of like, you know, it's like in a situation where you are experiencing like a flood and you have to evacuate uh, because of flooding or you have to go somewhere else. Um, you know, culture is going to play a role there too, and uh, we need to think about that uh, too uh, in a critical way, and particularly with like an open perspective, such as so like to allow like more diverse representation for sure, but also to kind of like be being able to access more places that otherwise wouldn't have access to this this material. Yeah, uh, just related, but slightly off topic. I remember my friend Larissa and I, we wrote this newsletter and we came across um, the whole climate, um, the, the footprint, the digital footprint that uh, institutions have and when your um, information that you're putting on the website or your collection is not easily findable, it actually loads server space a lot more, mm -hmm. loads the server a lot more. So that was a very interesting connection and to both of us, it was like, wow, we never really think of this, that when we can't find something, it actually adds to the server. And these, these are like small, um, tiny steps, maybe that institutions are yet to even take into their consideration. But it was interesting coming across that research and that initiative. I, I might actually jump in because I think it relates to some of, um, some of the discussion that we just had around um, around digital and environmental concerns. And, you know, I think um, what, what we're often losing sight of is uh, really kind of the profound material impact of digital on um, the climate crisis. Um, and even uh, the, the inequities that, you know, we're all concerned with around um, the invisibilization of labor, right? The the specific communities where the mines are that um, extraction occurs, cobalt, lithium, you know, these places and um, the local people who work in them um, to really meet the demand of um, of digital. And so when you know, I think we often think about very rightfully so, the, the interesting connections that we can make through digital and the ways in which digital can um, reduce travel, can uh, enable access you know, on um, different levels and at different scales, but at the same time, there is a very physical material cost that's associated with that that doesn't necessarily make it into the conversation. Um, there's a lot of waste that surrounds digital technologies, you know, things turning over, 
processing, um, you know, speeds, things that are, are energy draining um, in and of themselves. So one of the challenges that I, I, I would love to see us kind of respond to is um, how we think about open glam um, and really intentional digital activities like open glam can be analog too, right? Open glam can be something that doesn't have to exist in these digital spheres and online and everything else, but like maybe we pull back a bit and maybe we think a bit more local about, um, about what it is that we wanna achieve um, in, in our various communities. And when we engage with digital, it's very intentional and it's with an awareness of, um, where the offset uh, is experienced in the decisions that we take um, around digital technologies and digitization and digital collections. Um, so that, you know, it's not anything that I think we can necessarily solve here, but it is, I think, uh, a really critical issue that, that we need to start thinking about when we think about buying the next um, emerging 3D scanner and scanning something that we already have scans of and putting those online um, and using open source platforms and um, thinking about what the actual footprint is um, to those those very individual decisions that are being being made on a, on a mass scale. Can I add a little a little thought onto that, Andrea? I, I, I think you're exactly right. And I think the the message that I've been trying to to spread with the the organizations I'm working with is, you know, the work of cultural the cultural sector is going to emit carbon. It's going to use electricity. Um, make it count. Yeah. You know, make it count. Uh, and and you you sort of uh, almost almost as an aside said something about figuring out what we want to achieve in our communities. And to me, that's really the the key. And, and organizations, collecting organizations, cultural organizations that have a clear concept of what they, what impact they want to help create in, in, in society aren't, are, are moving ahead, are, are doing things, often finding open as a, as a path forward and ones that really have no idea. And I've worked with a lot of them, um, really have no idea what impact they want to have in society, which are still trying to decide whether to have websites or to digitize at all, um, because there's no, there's no basis for, deciding uh, uh, what tools are important and which um, but I don't I don't want I don't want cultural institutions to shy away from using digital out of fear of the digital footprint we're gonna burn we're gonna burn things in the short term at least um, but we got to we just have to make sure it counts it's meaningful uh, and the onus is on us to do that oh, I don't I don't think that they should shy away from digital I think that like this is kind of the point right it's like it's more like let's have more of this challenging conversations too in the sense that I think there's like a lot of space to learn too there right because I think that in some cases like we can actually like talk about like the material for print but also we can talk about how organizations and particularly how cultural heritage organizations can be actors of change right so you know uh, greening the grid. So, for example, if like electricity consumption is like one of your main problems, of course, like greening the grid also has like material consumption, etc. Like we we can all agree that like there is no like easy solution for any of these problems. Um, but I think that it's it's also like trying to connect those solutions back to some of the um, problems that we've already identified, right? In the sense that, for example, to me. Like this whole conversation about interoperability is key to, to the conversation about sustainability and to also like reducing your carbon footprint, right? If you're like digitizing 10 times like the Mona Lisa, <laughs> right? To put an example that is very close to Andrea, um, and all of the times like you make like bigger and bigger copies of that, like maybe there are like there is a use of resources there. That is really not being like the smartest one that you could be like putting into work. And if we have like like again to my point of interoperability, we could also have a little bit more sustainability to there and like a better use of our resources um, by you know kind of thinking in ways in which we can also be more efficient in how we approach some of this like digital like transformations that we need to do because like, you know, there's no way that we can be like, no, no, we like, this is not an important thing. We should all be doing X, right? Like this is part of the world we live in, right? But 
there's also conversations to be had around like how we want to participate in the current world that we live in. So. Can, can I put another couple of pins on this map? Um, uh, and I've seen, I've, I've seen, I, I think a big obstacle to our forward progress in kind of conceptualizing and executing, prosecuting, doing open culture is this, when we, you know, what, what do we actually mean when we say culture? And I think in, in, in Europe in particular, it, 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 we, we, we will talk in broad sweeping terms about the importance of culture, but when we actually get to operationalizing that, what we really mean is official patrimonial cultural institutions, mostly art museums, um, mostly museums, mostly art museums. And there's this, I think, this huge dark matter of cultural participation that happens outside of the Aegeus of the collecting institutions and establishment. And uh, I think, I think the, the more mindful and um, strategic we are about how we invoke this, how and when we invoke this word culture, um, will be very clarifying because there are a lot of tools and techniques and um, ways forward that don't necessarily have to go through collecting institutions at all. Um, uh, so I, I sort of want to re retake this uh, this word uh, this word culture. And related to that, I think there's a there's a human rights dimension to this that for me is very clarifying. I think you know, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, everyone has a right to enjoy and contribute to the cultural and scientific life of their community. And that, that right can be very difficult to enjoy, <laughs> to do. Uh, and open structures, open organizations, uh, places open in the sense where an institution, a collection belongs to everyone by right. Um, openness can be an instrument to achieve that. And, and I think that that human rights perspective is often very uh, missing in the debate. We're woefully undereducated in that uh, way of thinking here in the States. Uh, but I would like to see more of it, particularly as uh, climate forces dramatic social and technological change. Climate, AI, genetic engineering, fake news, you know, you name it, uh, force more and more severe uh, changes on pe the way people live life in the local community. Good and times, good times. So, I mean, something actually that is also like, I think a challenge, but something that I wanna see happen is more organization across institutions and collaboration, like to achieve, I don't know, the same um, sp like space or weight that a lot of uh, very well-organized lobbying <laughs> bodies are able to shape and influence, you know, the direction of these things. And so that is something that um, maybe is, is a potential for open glam and the network of institutions who are already coming together around some of, of these questions um, is to share openly the different progresses or findings or the ways that they've approached specific challenges is to compare those and um, think about how that can create some like industry standards some, some sector standards that then can shape and inform um, policy at national and international and, and even local levels. And so I think that's a really important um, aspect of this like machine of open glam that remains untapped because of all the different ways in which people are experiencing it or entering the space or still grappling with copyright or what should we digitize? How do we digitize it? Um, and there's, I think, a lot of opportunity there um, to, to, to push that organization um, in a really meaningful way. Thinking about um, your use of your, you know, use of the term culture and thinking about what culture constitutes and what it could mean. And I was thinking about um, this experience of uh, promoting openness when it comes to art created by artisans and craftspeople that are already in the, that are already in the, in collections. Perhaps some of this art is really simple, and it means that when we create participation, others are able to create this art as well. Sometimes it means that um, people can use it for commercial purposes, like making a wallpaper. Where does it leave that artisan? 
who might have an opportunity to actually create something for a potential client, for instance. That I also see as um, a potential challenge to open culture. Who, who does open culture really, you know, push away? You know, sometimes I, I think about that, that when I take something like a miniature artwork, for example, from the Cleveland Museum of Art, and people want to blow it up and put it in their homes and print it and frame it, they could have just bought it from an artisan because in India, we still have artists creating those same, same artworks. So where does our opening collections leave them? It's, it's a question you, I, I, I mean, please feel free to reinterpret, interpret and share, yeah. Because for the artisan, it's their livelihood. It's their, and, and that's, that's what we again fight for that their livelihood is going away. Why should their future generations continue to paint those little eight by 10 miniature paintings that nobody is going to buy because it's easier to access it digitally and um, use it. So it's also another aspect of, and I struggle with it myself to understand how to justify this also sometimes. Well, but I think that's like a question that is more for creative commons <laughs> in a way to solve. Uh, and I'm going to be like, <laughs> in, the, in the sense that I think that, uh, you know, back in the day, like creative commons have a very like solid narrative in terms of like the story that like they've been telling themselves and that they've been telling to the world in a way, you know, the story of like Lawrence Lessig and identifying like the need for creators to like share their work with you know, other people, et cetera, et cetera, in like a increasing, uh, in an incre increasingly digital world where uh, sharing was easier and less costly, blah, 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 right? And so that's how the story goes. However, like one of the things that, you know, we've all seen <laughs> like working in different sides uh, of the open movement or, in, or um, different institutions, like, what we've seen is that like the places where like the adoption of Creative Commons licenses made most sense was actually institutions. And it was like, you know, from government institutions to uh, cultural heritage institutions to um, educational institutions uh, to open science. You can argue that um, there are individual creators in open science, but also like those individual creators are strongly tied to institutions. Um, so, you know, in a way, like the place where it made the most sense is like institutional, like, um, or, or sorry, like uh, knowledge uh, producing institu institutions. That's where like the CC licenses made the most sense. And I think that in a way, and, and this is not to dismiss the question, I'm, I'm pretty sure that like there are a lot of like things that we could go into like how individual creators are going to make their money or their art or whatever they are doing uh, in the current scenario. But it's also like trying to recognize where Creative Commons has been more successful and it has been within institutions. And, you know, in a way, this is like part of the conversation too, in terms of like how society produces knowledge, right? And it's very hard for society to to actually compensate individual creators, because what happens, and at least like this is a very like last minute interpretation, right? Is that um, the knowledge, like the value that knowledge has and the value that culture has is also accumulated and accrued over time too. And I think this is, and, and this goes back to the point where we started about colonization and decolonization, right? Like this is also a reason why this is so problematic too, because in a way it's not only like the culture that you're taking away, it's also the value that comes to that culture, the thing that you're taking away. And, you know, in a way you have to compensate in the, in the present because like that's where we are all living, uh, but also understanding like that value is not something that also happens individually, but also happens across time, across society, and like in a context. Um, so yeah, that's my two cents on that. So in my last, my last prompt to everyone is, what needs to change in order to, for the movement or for open culture to realize its potential? We kind of said like a lot of things, but I'm gonna like make that a, <laughs> a little bit more of like also like 
you know, trying to connect back to the copyright conversation and the open access conversation, because I think this is like a very important point. I think that uh, cultural heritage institutions need to move away from a risk-based approach to copyright to a transformational approach to copyright. I think that they have a lot of leverage on uh, changing the conversation around copyright. And I think that they need to use it. Like that's kind of my activist like standpoint too on that, right? It's like, if we are always like gonna just be like very concerned about like what copyright law says and what can I do and cannot do instead of like, what can you do as a social actor that has the ability to reach out to change makers, to influence policies like, um, this is like the conversation that I think that um, it's worth having inside institutions too as well. I agree with that. And I think also, um, you know, for me, it's uh, it's voting and making sure that we elect people who fund the public sector, fund institutions, set up funding schemes for artists, for um, creatives, for people to do research and really cool projects around some of these things rather than cutting taxes for corporations or that money doesn't right like where are we investing who's who's seeing the money how do we actually um build the financial and political and organizational structures that we want to see that then will shape and influence open culture and make decisions like okay we're gonna just apply CC0 to our digital collections seem like the obvious answer to do as opposed to something that may come with political or financial backlash um, to the to the individual institution. And so I'd love to see um, change happen on a, a governmental level around yeah how our organizations are funded. But that is not something <laughs> that any of us can solve here today except to go vote. So well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and start talking, even though I'm not exactly sure what's going to come out of my mouth. Um, I think from this conversation, it's an open question whether anything needs to change. There's a, a clear and evident set of behaviors and tools that any curious um, conference goer or researcher or uh, internet user can find, the cultural professional can find. Uh, there's 10 years of the Sharing is Caring conference, there's Andrea's work, there's the work that you and Doug are doing, there's your work scan, there's the entire Wikipedia community. I mean, all of these things, there are lots of examples out there. So um, one could take the point of view that uh, the toolkit's there. Uh, there doesn't need to be some massive intervention. It can be used, reapplied, remixed to solve local problems, policy problems, execution problems at any scale. Um, I'm not sure I'm really happy with that <laughs> answer uh, because I see, I see, I still see this, this, that's a moment of inflection, um, almost as if we've built, yeah, I've used this line before, we built two thirds of a bridge and we're, we're curious as why people aren't crossing over to the other side. And the next part of that bridge is more, it's high touch, it's, it's door to door, it's about um, uh, demonstrating for, for creative people in our communities, by which I mean writers, researchers, artists, citizens, everybody, um, how they are empowered to participate by open structures and how to do that and what that looks like. Uh, and I think some of the work that has been, you know, some of the work Marada Sanderhoff was doing at the National Gallery of Denmark, where they're actually showing people how to do that. Um, every Wikipedia edit-a-thon is showing people how that works. Um, this sort of behavior uh, should happen and needs to happen at scale. And those things happen with well-organized, focused, practiced networks that are, that are led and have strategy and are fricking determined. Uh, and I don't think we have that now, and that, that could be fine. Um, but I think for the beautiful future that I want, um, uh, and, and you know, uh, if I was a shoemaker, again, I'd be doing this in the shoemaking industry. I want to make sure we're using this 
cultural sector as a society is intelligently and, and equitably and constructively responsible. Uh, and I, and I, so I think there's work to do. And I, yeah. Uh, but just to say, yes, I think um, that with, with um, support in funding, with um, especially funding for um, institutions which do grapple with whether to open, whether it will uh, take away from their monetization practices. I think um, it's nice to have that web monetization experiment also going on and seeing where that leads us. So uh, maybe support there. 